this is going to be, uh, we're going to kick off the afternoon with our developer-led panel. And I'm going to, we have every, uh, we're going to kick off with some quick introductions. So I want every, uh, each person, I'm going to let you give your background. Um, and there are slides that I can see, so I'm going to try to coordinate. So we'll have um, Daniela, Projecta, Farah, and Yao all introduce themselves. And I think I have a slide in here, so I'll go <laughs> in there as well. So I'll uh, let Daniela kick it off. Hey, everybody. Um, feel free to trickle in. This is super casual. Don't feel like you're interrupting or anything. Um, and we also want this, to, I think, to be more of a flowing conversation. So if you have any questions, just raise, raise your hand, and, and we'll, try to, um, we'll try to get to everybody. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Daniela. I'm one of the co-founders here at Momento. Um, thank you so much for coming here today and supporting our event. Um, I hope you walk away today um, inspired to build something, um, whether it's on Momento or not. We are here to help you. Uh, we're here to ideate with you. If you have um, any kind of idea or question, come to our booth. Um, I'm sort of roaming around myself. Um, my background a little bit, my co-founder, Kwaja, um, and I met at AWS. So we have a lot of our AWS friends here as well. Um, so thank you all for your support. Uh, so previously, I was a tech lead on the DynamoDB team at, at AWS. Um, again, uh, if you were not here for the opening remark, we got a lot of our serverless and developer-focused uh, inspirations from our time at AWS. Subsequently, I spent a bunch of time building out platforms at an observability startup called LightStep, uh, based out of San Francisco. Um, there, I got a lot of inspiration on what it takes to run a company and uh, sort of grow a startup from very small customer lists to uh, you know, revenue, uh, millions in revenue, and so on and so forth. So today, uh, really excited to have a conversation with the rest of the panelists here about developer-led adoption. Thank you, Daniela. Also, we did have uh, everyone, we had them bring in extra chairs. So if people do want to mingle in, it's OK. We have more chairs now. <laughs> Um, next up is Farah. Hi, everybody. My name is Farah Campbell, uh, and I am the head of the Modern Compute community at Amazon Web Services. Um, I work a lot with uh, folks in serverless containers, uh, dev tools, front end web and mobile. And uh, prior to that, I was at a company called Stackery, which was a serverless enablement uh, platform. And I get to work with amazing uh, people that you've probably seen here, like Alex Debris, uh, Alan Helton. I know he's in here somewhere. Um, but yeah, that's a bit about me. Hi, I'm Jonky. You've probably seen me throughout the day. <laughs> um, I am our head of growth here at Momento. I was at AWS for almost six years before this, and I led product programming for the analytics and databases portfolio. I've worked with a lot of engineering teams, a lot of product managers. Um, it's been great, and I'm excited to be here with everyone. I actually know Projecta from AWS, and I messaged her, um, be like, hey, you should come do this. So next up is Projecta. Right. So hi, everyone. My name is Prajkta Damli. Super excited to be here. Um, I'm a product manager. Uh, I lead product teams for data governance at GCP currently. Um, and somebody asked me, what is data governance earlier? So uh, I do everything to build products to help customers find their data, access their data securely, um, uh, store their data, manage the whole life cycle, um, also build trust in their data. Uh, by enabling data quality, observability at scale. So we can talk a lot about data uh, governance uh, later on. Uh, but prior to Google, I was at AWS, where I worked very closely with Junkie. Uh, and I led product teams in the data and analytics space there, um, launching products like Glue, which is a serverless ETL product, uh, Lake Formation, and also had a short stint on RDS, um, and built a lot of products which were very developer focused. So very excited to be here today. Thank you. And then we have Yao. Hi. Um, hello again. <laughs> uh, um, my name is Yao. Uh, I have uh, been working on cash and performance. Uh, as you know, I think the role I've played in doing those things primarily was as a software engineer, but also pretty, did, pretty much did every possible job in the engineering org, like being on call, you know, the ops person, and, and uh, sometimes doing a bit of product stuff, and a very reluctant manager. Uh, and uh, now I am the CEO of our little startup, so things are not quite trending in the right direction in terms of uh, not doing management. Uh, so, uh, but uh, on the on the sort of 
technical side, I have always been a big believer and uh, hopefully contributor to open source projects. So most of my work uh, are open sourced or open source related. So I, I enjoy sort of having a community around the things I do. Awesome. I don't know what the slides, I don't even know if we didn't really make slides. So yeah, was the uh, feature for the, at the end. So um, the session is um, leading our developer-led adoption and how you lead for that. So first question I have uh, for the group is, what are the different types of developer personas you've come across and that you've had to build for? Anyone, I don't know. Who, whoever wants to go first, you can. <laughs> I guess I can kick it off um, and I'll keep it short. So in my uh, early, very early on in my career, I was very focused on the infrastructure engineer persona. So uh, think backend, think databases, think, um, you know, not JavaScript <laughs> essentially. When I started, um, it was very Java centric. Uh, and then I also have tinkered around with uh, both Golang and Rust. Um, now, in more recent years, this democratization of um, programming in general, really great programs that very quickly educate people on what software engineering is and how it uh, evolves. Um, I've now sort of discovered this whole new persona where people are just builders, right? There's not really one discipline or one programming language or one stack that defines them. And uh, that's where also being in the start startup world has kind of introduced me to this persona where um, only the end result and the time to market matters. Um, there's a lot of names for these kinds of engineers, product engineers, application engineers, um, like I said, builders, hackers. Um, but that's sort of been my own experience seeing the transformation of, of um, you know, and there's so, so many more out there. So I'm kind of curious to see what, what others here think. Um, so I have primarily worked closely or built products closely for data engineers, which uh, sort of are responsible for making data available for a variety of use in an organization and to really power that data-driven culture and data-driven decision-making uh, within an organization. And now, I think earlier in the, in the morning talks, there was a lot of mention about ML and operationalizing ML, and there's a new sort of genre of uh, developers coming uh, coming to life. Um, I don't know if they're new or not, but there's a new term for the work that they're doing called ML ops engineers. Um, and um, regardless of you know what uh, title uh, these uh, developers have, I think what you said is very true. Like uh, kind of time to market is sort of top of mind for many of them, whether it's an application or whether you know getting uh, data of the right quality. Uh, in the right time to their end consumers. Um, I, I've seen that as the top concern. And um, uh, when I was launching Glue, I think uh, one category that really stood out for me was, you know, what I started calling citizen data engineers. So these were not, you know, your big data experts or, you know, Spark experts who wanted to take a cluster and tune it and do all that stuff, but they wanted to get quick access to something like Spark and really leverage the power of Spark to get what they were doing, which is you know a bunch of data transformations. So. Yeah, and then how about you, Farah? Because from your end, right, you're with the AWS community, you work with the community builders, so what's your experience, right, when you're working with different developer personas? Yeah, so um, at AWS, I'm, you know, I manage the global uh, community uh, for, again, with the serverless, containers, dev tools, front and web, web and mobile. And it's also the community builders, plus we also have the heroes. So I work with everything from new, you know, people that are new to the cloud that are just getting started on their journey, uh, I, all the way up to people that are, you know, right off the edge and understand, you know, they're early adopters. Um, I work a lot with open source maintainers, uh, and it's anything from, like, back end to front end, you know, DevOps. Uh, really, uh, I, I feel like I, I feel like I work with every type of engineer that there is, uh, just because we do have so many people in the community. I don't know how to define personas. For, for, for me, my observation is there are two types of developers, and it's kind of uh, contextual. There are developers who have an intrinsic interest in the project and are willing to suffer. And there are and there are developers who are very sort of uh, judicious about their ROI and they want to do something that they really care about using it as as a tool means to an end. 
And if it doesn't pan out the way they want it, they will retreat. And uh, I would say 99% of the time, the developers is in the second category. So it's it's all about sort of it, is it smooth? You have an, an you know easy access, right? Um, versus if if you find that one percent developer who is really there for the technology, then then you want them to turn them into your core core community, and then just sort of being able to tell the difference between these two types. I think across the board, I saw a lot of different people nodding their heads. So it's like it's such a wide range. So I think something always hits home for someone, and it's such. Um, there's so much variation, right? For what kinds of developers there are, what they care about. How the but the question is, how do you figure out what to build for them? So, like, how do you hone in on that? Like, when you're looking at the things you're trying to do, and I will let anyone take that first. Wait, I'm going a, off script. I have a follow so. follow up question to what Yao said. What was the one person you said some developers were intrinsically willing to suffer through not this? intrinsic but for example i i might be willing you know i did rewrite an entire cache framework because i didn't like what i was seeing right so in that case i was willing to suffer but am i willing to suffer to do a different project maybe not right so so it's it's, it's a both sort of uh, a personality thing and also is it the, a subject that you really care deeply about so, so that's why i say it's kind of situational yeah i'm curious actually in the audience like hands up if you feel like you've come across or you have like you define yourself as possibly fitting into the one person. Let's see if it's actually one person. The one Raise person. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I'm definitely not in the one person. I will take the easy path. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's that's really interesting that um, that you I guess were once in the one person for something, mm -hmm. but maybe no longer there, right? Yeah. So um, I had one for Projecta. Um, you've run large scale cloud organizations, right, right, with the main focus on data. What are the challenges um, when you're working with data and back end engineers um, compared to full stack application engineers? Um, so I think um, it really depends on what what you're doing. I, I don't know if I really make the distinction between back end and, and front end engineers necessarily, uh, but I guess. Um, mostly for the 99% of the developers. Um, there are some, I mean, the ideal situation is that you have the perfect system. It's highly available, uh, durable. You get access to data in a secure, privacy-safe way. Um, you can have the full like sort of test cycle, uh, dev test, prod cycle built around it. And that comes over time, but I guess um, it's, it's usually a trade-off between um, how much sort of uh, support like supporting sort of system there is around a specific technology or a data format that somebody is trying to access, uh, and whether your preference is to go with a more sort of matured stack which has all of that. It has an active community uh, that can support you. Uh, it has you know the right libraries, code, code plugins, um, and potentially even like managed services uh, by certain vendors who can give you that, um, who can lower sort of the overhead of uh, adopting a technology and, and managing that technology to access data. Versus, you know, if you want to access, if you want to uh, adopt something cutting edge that's just upcoming, I mean, I think the LLM models example is a great one right now. It's, there's still a lot to be done to like truly take that and productionalize it. Um, but you know, there's certainly value in kind of embedding that uh, into your overall application or um, into your uh, uh, overall offering that you're building. Uh, so it's it's usually that trade-off, like ease of use versus uh, kind of adopting something that is really cutting edge um, and and being ahead of the curve. What's the toughest trade-off you've ever had to make? Um, when, uh, in order, so in terms of building for yeah. developers. Uh, wow, there are many. <laughs> um, I think it's um, it, so when, when when I launched Glue, uh, it was the first sort of serverless Spark offering out there, and there was a lot of uh, like if if I went to my Spark developers or customers, there was a lot of demand on what are the different knobs and and configurations that they would have desired in a serverless system, and and it was it was really challenging to figure out what is the minimal set of uh, configurations that we could offer 
uh, and who should be the real target sort of developer persona that would adopt that uh, to begin with. And over time, I think Glue has evolved and um, added a, a, a whole set of functionality around it. Uh, but things like scale up was not something that Glue was supporting uh, from the beginning. Uh, and other sort of configuration uh, monitoring capabilities. So the, yeah, I think that would be the example. I remember those that. So <laughs> I remember when that was going on. Um, what about yeah? I mean, I think that's a great question. What's the hardest trade-off you've ever like? Right, based on like when looking at something, or you don't have one? I have not. Like I, I feel like I'm so ill-equipped to answer any questions for this panel, just because I have not really been on the side of like. I have open source projects, but I haven't really put into serious effort into put it into the hands of developers, right? So, so if I may, I would yeah. actually want to. This is a great opportunity to ask questions to the experts. So, so I have a question yeah. for the rest of you, which is, um, how do you? It, it, you can think of it as sort of like a top of the funnel, right? Mm -hmm. And and to the endpoint, how do you tell how far along someone is if you ask them like? Have you heard of it? Have you used it? What did you do with it? What do you plan to do with it in the future? Like, is there a way to assess how far along someone is in terms of their interest and engagement? And how do you sort of encourage them to move along in the direction that you think is mutually beneficial? For a specific, like, technology or? Yeah. Um, so how do you know are, you the, are there milestones? You're like, OK, if they have tried the thing, then that's further along than if they haven't even heard of it, right? That's very obvious. But but is there a systematic way of sort of assessing the uh, the, the level of engagement from uh, the developer community? Um, I, I I can I can provide some of my inputs. I think there's certainly awareness. So are are people aware of it? Um, and that's probably the first step. Um, at lunch, I was talking to um, Alan, I think, who oh there. And we were talking about, like, I think in today's sort of social media first world, uh, like, in, like finding influencers who can really evangelize or developer evangelists, developer, developer advocates who can really evangelize a new technology is, is kind of pa paramount to bringing that awareness. But then, you know, awareness is just a first step. Like, you know, if the technology really truly delivers on the value, then you should see like some level of like POCs, uh, try uh, some developers trying it out. And then if they're really like engaged, they would also contribute, like uh, contribute back. Like they would provide samples of things that they have built using your technology or contribute back if it's an open source project. Um, and that would be sort of like the different milestones and uh, measures. And certainly if somebody's putting things in production and you're seeing that adoption, that's a clear signal. Uh, but I would think that that would be. Yeah. Uh, I think it's all about, like, literally time is money nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. Like, developers are so busy. And, and to be honest, we're drowned in information from all kinds of channels, right? It, it used to be, you know, before, you know, the mobile web 2.0 or whatever, there's, like, a limited amount of data that's available, right? And, you know, you, you search on the web or you go to Stack Overflow and or you ask your friends. But now there's sort of information flowing at us in all directions. So really what people are willing to spend time on. So the way I think about it is really on the order of minutes, hours, days, weeks, right? So minutes, you hear about it from your friend, you spend a minute Googling it, thinking about it, done, right? Hours, you spend a little bit of time, you look at their website, maybe you read the API reference, you read some reference um, architecture, learn a little bit more about a technology or a product. Hours, you start hacking on it a little bit, maybe you download something, install it on your laptop, try to follow a tutorial, um, and then you know it goes into days and weeks, right? Uh, actual projects, POCs, deploying into production, goes into months and years. So. It really, when you ask that person, it's about assessing: Have you spent, you know, minutes on it, or have you spent days and or or weeks on it? And a very relevant subject is, you know, spare cycles. Like literally, in the past six months, my developer friends, when they have spare cycles, they're spending it on AI, right? Building AI, reading about AI, learning what embeddings are, attending a conference to learn about, you know, 
AI and, and ML. So like that's a huge signal, right? And and you know, apart from the hype, I think hype aside, if people are spending their money, which is time, that's the currency on on this subject, like there's there's something here. So um, that's kind of how I look at. Um, obviously, it's a very broad subject for for AI, but then when you when you assess actual projects, then you can see, okay, this is where people are spending their time. Um, and uh, that's been like a very uh, accurate litmus test for me. Yes, I hope people don't feel like they're drowning in information here. So, <laughs> um, and then Farah though, like, right, you're introducing new technologies as they come out, right, with AWS, like within the Hero Community Builders. Um, what about you, right? Like you have a different like side as well, like where you're trying to evangelize and how do you figure out like, hey, this is, this is moving, like, right? Yeah, I would say, are they engaging with us? I mean, are they asking questions? Are they following tutorials and you know providing feedback? And you know, um, if it's an open source project, are we seeing pull requests? But a lot of us, you know, like, do we see questions on Stack Overflow? Do we see it in other forums? Or you know, people engaging with each other on social media and sharing either wins or asking for help trying to troubleshoot. I think those are all really good signals that you know people are starting to adopt and to get further along. If they're not asking questions and they're probably not using it, and I think that's a bad signal. Um, what about I mean, like people personally, right? Like they have their in technologies they're interested in, but do you feel um, what, when someone's at a large company versus startup, like do you see like, what do you see, like what they care about? Do you see differences? It's mostly the same. Um, no, from like Stackery to AWS, I feel like some of the things are very, very similar. I mean, people want to make sure that, uh, that that the integration that they can integrate with existing tooling that it works with their infrastructure. You know, things like the CI/CD pipelines and you know, monitoring tools. They need to make sure it's like the security. Understand like how the data is going to be managed. You know, access controls, uh, and if they're at compliance, uh, you know, making sure that they can meet those standards. Um, I say ease of use, you know, can I get started with this quickly? Can I understand the documentation? Is there support out there? Um, I think documentation is like one of the uh, one, a critical piece. And so if a company doesn't have that, I mean, I know at Stackery we were working really hard ensuring our docs were always up to date and that we had tutorials out there. Uh, you know, we do the same thing at AWS. Um, what else? Uh, oh, I'd say like like strong community support, right? That's also a good, a good signal. And, you know, um, we really wanted to, encourage community uh, to, you know, to get involved and to help troubleshoot and to ask questions and again, engage with us. So um, I, I think those are like the always top of mind for us. I think there is a bit of different sort of priorities for very large organizations and very small ones. Generally, you never want to be the biggest user of anything because that means you will run into problems before other people's do, right? And, and if you are big, then your problems will be more visible. So, so there's a bit of a dilemma here, uh, I think, for, for the providers is like providers want customers to figure out the edge cases for them, right? But on the other hand, nobody wants to be the one that's sticking, sticking out. So, so I, think, I think it's less uh, obvious. I think it's def definitely not as uh, noticeable at this point because cloud technology in, has matured dramatically. But you know, when I first started at Twitter, it was not, no questions were asked about building something in-house in a lot of cases because it's like, oh yeah, the scale is there, right? But, but that is increasingly rare these days. And you have to be in the maybe top two or three to, for, for a lot of that to be justified. Nobody is building a storage engine. Everybody's using Rocks DB, right? That, that's just an example. So, so, so I think the, the bar is raised and, and the tail is getting longer and longer. The tail, as in you are not the sticking out part, but, but in the rare case that you are, then I, I think it, it will be a very different calculation for those players. Does that, does that mean? Does that mean you're on the buy train instead of in the build versus buy? It sounds like you're saying like. I'm saying increasingly it's harder and harder to make the case for build, right? And, and, and 
I, but, I don't but we still see it a ton, right? Like very well, well respectful companies do a lot of building in house and, and sort of. I think what build means is a little different. Uh, I, I think it, it it tends to be more like Lego making. I, I'm mixing these two components together versus I'm doing writing my first line of code and and that will be the brick of my castle, right? That's going to be the foundation of my castle. That that's less common. For that, yeah, I feel like we also are really focused on like, right, when you see products on the market, things that we're building for. But what about um, internally, like driving developer adoption internally within your team? Not like I feel like, right, we're used to like, at least I know for us, yep. hey, like you over here, adopt this, that. But what about internally and like, hey, you have like a large organization like Twitter and like how, what about developer led adoption from that view? So. So I have a bit of a theory, which is uh, I I think everybody here is much more experienced at, at you know driving the funnel, right? Like get people in, in through the door and then move them along. But I I my theory is more about retention, like what turns people away. I think uh, in the end, I, I sort of like whether something convert all the way to the end ends up being do you have like this deal breaker, it, it may be different things for different people, but is there a deal breaker that will just cut out a percentage of your potential customers because they cannot tolerate that? So so I, I, internally, I think it it's often quite incidental what we started with. It's, it's a lot about exposure, right? I've seen this technology, it sounds good, I'm gonna look at it, so that's incidental, but whether that makes it to the finishing line or not, it, it, it comes down to is there a deal breaker or not? Yeah. That that is very true. I think uh, just looking at the customers who are adopting the products as well from a cloud provider perspective, um, the deal breakers can be very different. Like for a company that is Twitter, maybe the scale and the latency and and just the availability of of its services is probably the most important. And if the technology of the product cannot support that, then you know Twitter would never like the developers at Twitter would probably never adopt it. But I've come across many large organizations that are not as uh, what would we call technologically advanced or technologically forward, who don't have as big of a data challenge or a scale challenge, but their deal breakers often come down to things like security or privacy or certification, especially if they're in regulated industry. So it really depends on who are you talking to, which developers, and, and I guess that's another facet to personas. Let's give a round of applause for our great women leaders. And... It's not often we can, everyone gets together, especially after the pandemic, but to have four very strong women leaders, um, it was great. Thank you for all taking the time, so. Thank you for having us. Yes. Oh, I had one miscellaneous thing, is I met a few people who asked about the QR code challenge, and I promised them that I would point out to them, Chris Price, can you yes. raise your hand, please? Chris Price. He's um, gotten all of them, right? Yes. So if you need hints, and you're missing the last one or two or three, He's the guy. Yes. And then um, but because you said Legos building for it to win your a Lego set. So, um, but yes, do find Chris. And then um, next up, we have Shingo, from, who came all the way from Japan. So let's, we'll transition over to Shingo. So if you want to come up. And thank you all so much.